Stephen, in your book, um, Enlightenment Now and other works, you've been tarred and feathered, so to speak, as an optimist. I mean, you make the case that things are improving, and there's there's a number of public intellectuals who make the same sort of argument, Bjorn Lomberg, for example, and Matt Ridley, uh, uh, Marion Tupi, all of detailed ways that the world has improved dramatically over, especially over the last 30 years, but certainly over the last 150. And yet we seem to be polarizing terribly at the moment. And so what do you think is driving that given that you know, arguably things are better than they have been. Yeah, I, I tend to uh, try to squirm out of the uh, uh, optimist pigeonhole because I'm not arguing for looking on the bright side mm -hmm. and seeing the glass is half full, and, but rather just basing your understanding of the world on data rather than mm -hmm. uh, journalism. The problem with journalism being that it is a highly non-random sample of the worst things that have happened in any given period. It is an availability machine in the sense of Amos Tversky and Daniel, Daniel Kahneman's availability heuristic, namely our sense of of risk and danger and prevalence is driven by uh, anecdotes and images and narratives that are available in memory. Whereas the, uh, since a lot of good things are either things that don't happen, like a country uh, at peace or a, uh, a city that has not been attacked by terrorists, which almost by definition are not news, or are things that build up incrementally, a few percentage points a year and then compound, like the decline of uh, extreme poverty, we can be uh, uh, unaware, we can be out to lunch about what's happening in the world if we base our view on the news. If instead we base our, our uh, view on data, then not only do we see that many although not all things have uh, gotten better, not linearly, not, uh, not without uh, setbacks and reversals, but, but uh, in general, a lot better. Uh, and it also, uh, paradoxically, because uh, as I've uh, also cheaply put it, uh, progressives hate progress, mm -hmm. but the best possible case for progress, that is for striving for more progress in the future, for being a true progressive, uh, is again, not to have some kind of foolish hope, but to look at the fact that progress has taken place in the past. And that means why should it stop now? Uh, we know that it's- What does he mean by that? Progressives hate progress. He means that it, it get, they're not allowed to bitch anymore once progress is made. Like they, ah, their whole identity right. comes from the fact that they see the world as needing to be improved. So mm -hmm. as soon as progress happens, they're like, oh, that doesn't count. There's so much I left to done to do. So, you have to like. Right. So he's, yeah, so it's completely true. He's, they have to continually downplay any progress society makes because their whole job or grift, if you want to phrase it. Yeah, that exactly. Way. Yeah. And that's, is to promote this progress. And we see this is, we see this so much. This is why all the, all these institutions, all these uh, uh, firms that are dedicated to, you know, creating racial equality in the country of course, are going to hyper fixate on the fact that there's all these racial problems in our country that are not getting better because it's literally their job to do that. Yeah, I use this to our advantage in the Big Joel debate when I asked him about what he would like the Republican Party to do about gay marriage and gay rights mm -hmm. and stuff. And he was like, I want them to hate gays, basically, is what he said. Is an interesting tweet from Stephen Pinker from 2018. Oh, you're looking back. <laughs> well, I, I just Googled uh, progressives hate progress and it's all like Stephen Pinker stuff. Oh, okay. Um, Cause he's the only one that really frame, he's the only one that frame it this way. Of which course, is, this is a great way to would frame never it. frame it this way. It makes this, it seem like a, morons. That's a, such a good, um, no, but I mean, it's such a good like framing, like the right should really pick this up. Progressives hate progress. Mm -hmm. Um. It says, another example of how progressive hate, hate progress, preferring the worse, the better. Uh, and it's a, it's a Cato. He actually linked a Cato Institute article. Wow. And it's all about how says the leftists are trying to muddy the waters on falling global poverty. And it's all about how global, global poverty, poverty is getting way, way, way better. And people are getting way richer. And yet on the left, they're continually downplaying efforts that have Specifically, leftists are downplaying how capitalism has really pushed people out of poverty over the last hundred years or so. We're going to solve climate change, and they're still going to be bitching about it like a hundred <laughs> years from now. A hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to be like, it's paradise. What are you talking about? No, the end is coming. Well, that's what's funny because like, I was actually thinking about this the other day, that we have people on both the left and the right who are kind of 
I think, engaged in this utopianistic thinking of wanting the world to be vastly different. And if it's just, if we had this vastly different system, we'd live in this perfect utopia where everything would be better. And I was just thinking about like, all these people are going to be just as unhappy now. They'd be just as unhappy under their quote, uh, you know, utopian systems of government as they are now, because it's their personality types that make them unhappy. Yeah, It's exactly. the personality types that make them think there's some better way, either if you're on the left, the better way is in this future that's never existed. And if you're on the right, it's this past that never existed. And those people will always continually look in those directions for something better. Yeah, they will. And I think that's one of Scott Adams' brilliant lines is that people can't really get a sense of how things are. They can just have a sense of the, the direction they think things are going. When we have the Star Trek replicators and you basically can do whatever you want, there's no limitations mm -hmm. on human ingenuity or imagination. They're going to be like, right. those people are happier than us. <laughs> They're happier than us. They have well, more the happiness. Right, right. Well, I mean, l listen, when we have that future, there's going to be a big pushback. I mean, we hear this from, you know, Sargon a lot. The big pushback is, you know, we were happier when we were, you know, there's too many people that aren't working, right? Mm -hmm. People were happier when they had this sense of purpose to work. And there's, there's some truth to that. Why don't we I just... think we can, I think we can manage both. I think we can find purpose in the Star War, Star Trek uh, replicator future. We just have the naked and afraid island. We just dump them off. <laughs> we're like, okay, you want to struggle here? <laughs> Look, an island full of dangerous, poisonous snakes. Well, you're right. And, and you know what? And that's a good, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing because that's always what happens in Star Trek is that the people that want to experience that, they go off and try to colonize the planet, which yeah. is the naked and afraid. They know, go where the struggle is. I right. keep looking for, I've watched this documentary on the moon mm -hmm. a long time ago and I can't find it anywhere now, but it's about how America kind of gave up on colonizing the moon and they interview a bunch of people who want to go live on the moon. <laughs> they, as harsh as it is, there are people who were like, yeah, sign me up. I'll go fucking live yeah. there. Well, I want to conquer this. Right. And we, and it's a good thing that we have people like that. Yeah. Kind of push the boundaries of society outward and forward. Their, their, their attitude is basically my life sucks here. Like I can't imagine my life being more, sure. worse than it is now. Hell well, yeah. That's like an extreme version of, you know, the, the immigrant mentality, the immigrant personality type. Like I, you know, my life sucks here or it could be better elsewhere. So let me leave everything behind and go somewhere completely different. Yeah. That's the American spirit right there. We've been, right. we've been brain draining the rest of the world for people that have that spirit. They've been contributing to our gene pool. And that's what, one of the reasons why I think America is mm -hmm. as, as amazing as it is. And I don't know, people, I mean, obviously there's like a cultural and psychological aspect to that, but I don't, I just like people that are worried that we'll lose these personality types in the future. I just, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff is just biological. I don't think we're going to lose any of, I don't think we're going to lose any of this stuff going forward in the future. Yeah. I think people, I think these are personality types that are pretty hardwired into individuals. Yeah. I think they're as hardwired as like male and female. I think yeah. personality yeah. types are churned out. It would be interesting to study the numbers on them, but I, I wonder, because there's a mechanism for there being males and females in roughly equal numbers. Sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a mechanism that churns out personality types in equal numbers of certain hmm. personality types. Like there's a I certain mean, amount of openness mm -hmm. to new experience. You, you gotta have that. Right. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. There's so much interesting stuff. This is another thing that really kills me about the sociology departments being taken over by these critical race theorists. There's so many interesting things to study in, in sociology, in behavioral psychology, in social psychology, that the smart people are just not going to be attracted to those departments because you've got so many of these fucking racist idiots in there. It's just a, mm -hmm. a toxic environment to try to develop something. Like as soon as you come out with some experiment like that, they're going to accuse you of biological determinism and make like a big fucking hubbub about it. You're like, no, no, I just, I'm curious about this one. No, they're going to turn it into a big racist thing. And like we're gonna we're marching in the wrong direction. We right. should be figuring what, this shit out. It's good it's good versus evil as opposed to true. Yes. True. 
Yeah. So it's yeah. so sad. It's so sad. We could be doing. I mean, I'm sure we have a lot of people in college who listen to the show that I'm sure would love to be working on these kinds of problems, but mm-hmm. it just well, I'm, t- I'm telling you, listen, here's, here's, here's your prediction. Once gene editing becomes like a big thing 50 years from now, mm-hmm. none of these biological 50. topics will be taboo because taboo, everything can be changed. That's the only reason it's taboo because you can't do anything about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I guess you're right. Yeah, as soon as you can fix it. Yeah. You're going to be like, what? as soon as the as soon as the IVF doctor comes out and asks you, would you like your son to be gay or straight? <laughs> like people are going to lose their fucking minds. People are going to lose their fucking minds. Well, the crazy thing is going to be because because at first what will happen here, here's the progression of events. First, what will happen is they'll, they'll fix, you know, disease, like, you know, birth defects and diseases and, and congenital, uh, you know, oh, your son has, you know, a high chance of getting cancer in their life or whatever. They'll fix all that stuff. And that'll be all pretty uncontroversial. The issue will then be, then they'll start raising people's IQ. Mm-hmm. And oh, then yeah. you start to get into like weird territory because, you know, everyone's like, okay, you know, make everyone smarter. That doesn't really seem to be bad. What's going to start to get really crazy is when they can start changing people's personalities. Cause then yeah. it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> then you get into like the dangerous territory of like, oh, are we going to live in the rave new world where you create like a class of placid people or not? This, I don't think this is 50 years away either because I, they already ha- have how this is technologically possible laid out because mm-hmm. they can use, they, they can create stem cells from, from skin cells and then they, they turn those stem cells into basically like a zygote and then they can impregnate with someone else. They can create like 96 different uh, embryos for each human being. And then they do gene testing on all of those embryos. So they aren't actually mm-hmm. like creating the, the genes. They're basically just producing a vast number of embryos. And then yeah, picking, right. And then selecting from yeah, them. Picking yeah, picking from sure. them. Yeah. No, that's a, yeah, that's a different, that process obviously will happen way sooner because it's way that's, easier. That's I'm think, ten, yeah. five, 10 years away, right. to be honest. Yeah, with you. sure, sure. I'm thinking more like the kind of gene editing where you could literally, right. just design you don't even have kid. to do it to a baby. You can do it to people that are you know living right now. Yeah, you give a list of description and they cook up right. the genome for exactly what you want. But that's, that's what's going to be crazy. That is They're, a long ways away. I, with gene editing, I wouldn't be surprised if they could inject you with something that would increase your intelligence now. Like it doesn't have to be your like a baby or anything. Hmm. Hmm. That would be very traumatic, I think. <laughs> I'm always curious what I mean, what makes intelligence? Because mm-hmm. I I think I have a very good memory. And I think so much of it is just from me having a good memory. Yes. Yeah. No, that's that's a lot of it is memory. So a lot of it is just how quickly you can put things together in your mind. So that's the general. So if I'm able to yeah. hold, if I'm able to hold 40, 50 recent things that I've heard in my, like, I don't, it's not even really short term memory. It's like mm-hmm. long term, but not super long term memory. If I'm able to hold those things, I have the capacity to, mix and match among those 40 or 50 different ideas well, someone who doesn't have, remember, have that i mean that's the to, essence of creativity there you have to remember though when you say hold things in your memory mm-hmm. a lot of like when you're talking about like this mid like mid-grade memory stuff people remember it it's just you have to kind of access it you have to they have problems accessing it yeah okay? you have to remind them of something that makes them go oh i know what you're talking about and so it's really, when you talk about memory, now some of it is you just, when you're talking about long-term memory, some things are just fucking lost forever. But when you're talking about what you're talking about, it's more like just a, people's ability to access the information quickly. Yeah. 